<clears throat> a story is told of a young soldier who had come home after having fought in the Vietnam War. He had landed on the west coast of the United States and he contacted his parents from the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Mom and Dad, I've finally come home. Uh, but I have a favor to ask. He says, I, I have a friend that I met, that I brought home with me from the war, uh, that I wanted to bring home with me. Father says, sure, uh, we'd love to meet him. Uh, there's something you should know, Dad, the son says. He said, the, the man I'm bringing home, he, he's been hurt pretty bad in the fighting. He stepped on a landmine and he lost one of his legs and uh, he's missing an arm. He has nowhere else to go and I would like him to come live with us. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear about this, son. Um, we, we'd love to have him come visit and we can definitely help him find a place to stay. Uh, but uh, you want him to come live with us? Yes, I want him to stay with us. <laughs> well, um, son, he says, said the father, <clears throat> you don't understand what you're asking. I mean, we can help him for a little while, but uh, he is gonna, he's got a pretty bad handicap, and this is going to require a lot of sacrifice and a lot of effort. Uh, we have our own lives to live, and we can let him stay here for a little while, but this is going to um, be a burden that I don't think we're going to be able to bear. He said, I think you should just come home and, and we'll talk about it for a little while, but I don't know if this is really going to work out. At this point, the son, he slams down the phone, he hangs up, and the, the parents don't hear from him again. In a few days, uh, the San Francisco police contacted the father, and um, they said that they believed they found his son. He had fallen off of a building, <coughs> and he had died. The police believe it was suicide. The parents are discouraged. They get on a plane and they fly over to the San Francisco area. They uh, go to the morgue and they identify the body of their son. <clears throat> they recognized him. It, it was their son, but to their horror, uh, when they saw the body, there was something they discovered that they didn't know before. Their son had just one arm and one leg. The boy wanted to be accepted by his parents. And when he knew that without that acceptance, he, he really just couldn't go on. And when he finally realized that his parents wouldn't receive him as he was, uh, he didn't want to live anymore. Uh, we all want to be accepted. You know, we, we, all, we, we want to be received by those around us, uh, but more than that, in every area of our life, we want to feel uh, like we're good enough. Uh, imagine when you're going to a job interview, if any of you have ever been through that, how stressful and straining that is. There you are sitting in the waiting room and uh, waiting for your turn, wondering if you've made the cut. Uh, are you good enough? You know, I mean, are they going to accept you? Uh, I read a statistic from some experts that said that 98% of job seekers are eliminated in the resume process. They don't even make it to the interview. One expert said that only 2% of candidates even get to the interview process. And so if, if you want a chance at getting a specific job from a particular employer, you really have to find a way to impress that employer and show him why you are better than everyone else and that you are the man for the job. They have to, the person has to be exactly what the employer is looking for or they're not going to be accepted. They're going to be turned away. That's a lot of pressure. And in most areas of our lives, we are faced with this kind of pressure of trying to measure up and wanting to be accepted and feeling sometimes as we've, we've failed the test. Imagine if somebody was renting your home, how would you feel, you know, what kind of a person would you want? You would want the person uh, that had uh, the reputation, that had the, uh, the layout of, of, and the history. Imagine if 
uh, you were wanting to hire a cleaning person or, or someone of that nature and wanted to hand over the keys to your house while you're working. You wouldn't just pick anyone. No, you'd pick the person who you knew you could trust. And just like in most all areas of life, we want to be acceptable. We want people to receive us. You know, it's the same with the Lord. I don't suspect there's a person in here that doesn't want to know for sure that God is receiving them when they pray unto Him. You know, God, are you hearing my prayer? We all want to know that God is, is listening to us when we call unto Him. I think it's safe to say that all of us would want to know that God is, is pleased with our, our lives. But what type of a person does God uh, hear? What kind of a prayer is God going to listen to? Uh, today I want us to continue down in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we are going to look at two different types of prayers. One of these prayers God is going to receive. The other one is going to be turned away. Uh, there are two different men in this parable in Luke 18. Uh, two guys, uh, both of them Praise unto the Lord. But which one is God going to listen to in the end? Which person does he choose? And why does he choose him? Why pick one over the other? I mean, what is it that the one has that the other seems to be lacking in the end? Last week, we looked at the beginning of Luke 18, and we talked about prayer and uh, how and why, excuse me, why we should be confident when we come before the Lord. And the reason that we should be, we can have confidence when we come unto God is because as we re read through that story of an unjust uh, judge and a poor widow and no one who cared about her, that God is not like that. That God really does care about us. And God wants to hear us when we pray. That God loves us and He wants us to pray unto Him. But this week I want to look at how we should come before the Lord. Uh, how should I approach God in prayer? To see this, we're going to look at the, the, a story, a parable, a second parable that Jesus gives here in Luke 18. In Luke 18, verses 9 through 17, <clears throat> Jesus is, again, talking to this group of people. Uh, he's specifically dealing with his disciples, but more than his disciples, there's a large crowd of people there. And he takes interest in, in, in one, one group within the group. There's a particular uh, flavor of people that Jesus wants to deal with at this point in the chapter. Jesus decides to talk to these men. These are the guys that have uh, really worked their entire lives to reach kind of the religious elite of the day. They are kind of the top-notch fellows, if you will. These scribes, these religious elite they come unto Jesus and they, they, they know that they have done everything to the letter. They have done everything that they could. They've studied the law. They know what it says and they have kept it to the T. The problem is, is that after uh, knowing all they've accomplished, this cockiness, if you will, this pride, has caused them to begin to look down on all the others in the crowd that day. And so Jesus gives a story for this group of people. He says in Luke 18, verse 9, Jesus spake a parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So he gives these men a lesson. He gives them a story, a parable of two different people. The first person in the story, of course, is the Pharisee. Here's the guy that, and we all know about the Pharisee, if you've read any uh, part of the Gospels, you understand that these were the men who really controlled the temple, the courts, well, those would have been the Sadducees, they, these were the guys that people would have come to, to, to get religious instruction. These, these guys uh, had done everything in their life right. But when you look at these, this Pharisee in Jerusalem these days, he would have been the type of person that you knew you could trust. I mean, he would have been the guy that you would have let in your home without, a, without ever wondering if he was going to do harm to you. You could trust the Pharisee. 
when he spoke something, you knew he was telling the truth. He didn't lie to people. He didn't uh, steal. He always went out of his way to do everything above and beyond in life. And when he does business with anyone in the city, you knew he wasn't going to take advantage of you. When he traded with you, you knew that it was going to be fair. He always made sure of that. He would never uh, extort others. He stood above everyone else in the city. Moreover, though, he was a just man. When you heard him speak, again, you knew you could believe him. He wasn't like others in the town. He, he didn't spend time uh, with loose women. He never committed adultery. He never was involved in fornication. But most of all, as you read through this parable, you catch very quickly that he's nothing like the other people in the temple that day. He was different. He stands out from all of them. And so as the Pharisee gives a testimony of himself, you learn pretty quickly what he thought of himself. The Pharisee fasted twice every single week. I don't know about you, Christian, but that's, that's not part of my story. Uh, and to be honest, it wasn't part of a lot of the Jewish people's stories of that day either. In the Old Testament, there were several times of the year when a Jewish person was required, according to the law, to fast. But nowhere in the entire Bible was anyone ever expected to fast two times every week. This was something the Pharisee had done because he wanted to be blameless. He wanted to be above reproach. And so on two separate occasions throughout, throughout the week, he would set apart a day where he would go without all food. Why? So he could be set apart unto the Lord. And so he could be in a place where he knew that God was pleased with all that he had done. He does this, but he does more. When you're reading through the parable, you hear him, he says he fasts twice every week. But beyond that, he tithes of everything that he owns. Now, 10%, that would have been enough, right, according to the law. But imagine what he means by this. It wasn't 10% of his income. It was 10% of everything he had. I don't know how you tithe shoes. You know, if somebody had given him shoes, I could just imagine this guy, you know, giving one shoe to the Lord. Why? Just in case, you know. Uh, if, if somebody had given him a pie, if, if he's to follow this through all the way, so the first pie would have, piece of pie would have gone to someone in the temple. I, I really don't know. But everything that he ever received, a tenth of it went to God. He gives things that were never required to be given of anybody. And so he thinks within himself that he has done everything that he could do to reach the top of the totem pole. <clears throat> And when you compare this Pharisee not just to all of the other people in the temple, but specifically to the second man in the story, he's definitely the better of the two. The, when, the second person that Jesus mentions in the parable is the publican. And if you know anything, again, about the Gospels, you know pretty quickly that the publican is nothing like the Pharisee. The publican was had nothing to offer as far as a testimony like this guy. He probably never tithed a day in his life. I can see him not even knowing what fasting meant. I mean, he wasn't a religious kind of a person. Publicans didn't spend any time in the temple, really, except to extort people. The publican was a guy that would cheat you at any chance he can get. He thought of no one but himself. Tax collectors of these days were thieves. And they were... They had it in with all of the leadership of the town. In fact, it's been told by many that they were given uh, the privilege, the authority to uh, stand along the roadways, the king's highway, all throughout in and out of Jerusalem, all throughout the Roman Empire. And they would tax your fish. They would tax your produce. They would tax pretty much anything that you brought into the city. And the thing is with these tax collectors is they would tax whatever they wanted. And believe me, they taxed everything that they could get out of you. They were hated by everyone. He probably spends his days in the bars. 
he was uh, loose with women. This tax collector had a testimony of being probably one of the wickedest people of his day. And if you and I saw the Pharisee and the, and the publican, and they were running for public office, if somebody wanted to be governor, every one of us would get out there and put our vote in for the Pharisee. Because we knew we could trust him. He was the guy that had the reputation. Read with me the prayer of these men in verse 10, down to verse 14. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a, a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee. I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. He was pleased with himself. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so the first prayer was really a prayer of thanksgiving. The Pharisee prays within himself, and if you think through the prayer, he really doesn't ask for anything, does he? The second prayer, the publican, he asked for just one thing. He asked for mercy. And it's at this point of the story where I think it really gets pretty fascinating. Because it's at this point in the parable where Jesus, he's going to kind of take our values and, and turn them upside down. Because when you think about which one the Lord accepts, the, the person whom the Lord receives in the end, if it was us, I, I would have, without reading into the heart of these men, I, I would have chosen the Pharisee. But the Lord doesn't do that. God, he does the exact opposite. This passage tells me that the Lord picks the lesser of the two. He accepted the prayer of the publican. And the Pharisee, with all of his testimony, with all of his life, with all of his background, with everything that he had to offer, his offerings, his tithes, all of the labors he's put into being where he was, he's rejected. He goes home having never been heard. And so the question is why? Why does God accept this man, the public, and why does he turn away from the other? You know, the difference between these two men had nothing to do with their life, had nothing to do with their testimony. In fact, Jesus alludes the difference between, to the difference between these guys. We already read it in verse number 9. I don't know if you caught it or not. In verse 9, Jesus said that he spoke this parable unto, unto and for those who trusted in themselves. He spoke this parable for the group of people that were looking at themselves as being righteous. And because of that, they despised everyone else. The difference between these guys had nothing to do with them, who they were and what they stood for. All it had to do with was who they trusted. You learn from this story of the publican and the Pharisee, the message I believe that God wants us to take away from this story is that God accepts anyone. No matter who you are, he accepts anyone who trusts in him and in his mercy. Not those who are trusting in themselves. The publican was looking toward God. He knew he had nothing to offer. He knew there was nothing within himself, and so he, didn't, he wasn't looking at himself. The Pharisee thought he had a pretty good standing with God. And so when he looks up to God, I don't even think he was considering whether God was listening or not. He prayed within himself. And if you want to understand exactly what Jesus wants us to take home from this, it's found in the last part of verse number 8, 14. Jesus says here, I tell you, 
this man, the publican, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And in the end, God receives the publican because he was trusting in his mercy. He believed that God would accept him, not because of who he was, but because of who God was. And he rejects the Pharisee because he trusts in himself instead of God. And what does that look like, though? I mean, obviously, you see the prayer of two different individuals. You see, obviously, what, what God says don't do. Don't trust in yourself, but trust in the Lord and trust in His mercy and in His grace. And God will receive you. But, but how do I do that? How does that play out in life? And that's what I love about how this story really ends. Because in Luke 18, I think God gives us a good picture of exactly what He's talking about. Because as He's standing there teaching these people this, this parable, some of the disciples, they begin to bring unto Him some children. In Luke 18, Jesus, or excuse me, the, the, the disciples that are listening to Him teach, they begin to notice that some people are bringing some kids by. And immediately, they're, they're just, whoa, no, 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 what are you doing? Hey, you, got, you guys have to stop. We've got an important uh, Bible study going on over here with the Lord. You need to, you need to guys need to just move along. And so, uh, they said, no, 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 the Lord, he's busy right now. Shoo, get, you've got to, you've got to uh, get the children away. And Jesus immediately says, stop, no, don't, don't do this. Allow the children to come. Well, we don't know if, he was uh, sitting or st standing, but I can just imagine as he uh, takes up a, a, one of the boys or the girls and he, he sticks them up on his knee. And he basically is saying, look, if you want to understand how you should be approaching God, this is exactly what it looks like. And he points to this li these little children. And he says, do you see this child? This is exactly what I'm talking about. He says, if you want to approach God and you want to know that God is receiving you, then approach Him as this little child has approached me. Mm. He says this, uh, he says children, well, he, he did, but in a sense, what he means is children, they, they don't trust themselves. They trust their parents. Kids don't uh, look to themselves for strength. They know they need help. They know they need guidance. And what he's saying is if you want to approach God in a way that is God is going to accept you. Come unto Him as this little child. Look with me at verse 18. He says in verse 15, excuse me, and they brought unto Him also infants, that He would touch them. But when His disciples saw it, they rebuked Him. But Jesus called them unto Him and said, Suffer little children to come unto Me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. And so in the end, this, this parable, this picture of the Pharisee and the publican is teaching us that when we come before the Lord, that we need to come before Him like this publican, that we need to come before God as a child. And God promises that if we'll come before Him like that, that we have no reason to faint, but that when we come before God, we can come before Him in confidence knowing that God is going to hear our prayer. Now, I know the context of this really is centered around salvation. But friend, the way you came to God to get saved is the way God wants you to come to Him every time. And so with that, that is, that is the lesson I believe that we can take from this passage, that when we pray unto God, we can, know, we can pray unto God with confidence. Why? Because God loves us and He cares about us. But when we come before Him, we should come before God as a child. Come before Him always knowing that God loves us, but that we should trust in Him and not in ourselves. And with that, I'm going to transition right into prayer requests tonight. Um, we, a pastor is going to be coming back on Saturday, so, so pray for that. Uh, but if you have any requests... Uh, that you would like us to pray for tonight. Um, pray for the vehicles that, that I that want the work because I got to pick them up on Saturday. So that's something that's been on my my heart. Uh.